Gentlemen, welcome to the third issue briefing of the day here, day two of the annual meeting of the new champions. You will have noticed um, as we're segueing through the through the meeting, we're moving subtly from from the science and technology. We had robots and mind reading and invisibility cloaks um, this morning. Moving on to financial regulation, and again here is another digital disruption, most definitely on the business <coughs> side of the meeting. We're talking about the sharing economy in this session. I'm very, very glad and proud to be uh, joined by an expert not just in the sharing economy, but um, an expert all round in digital transformation and the effect it's having on jobs, employment and skills. It is Aaron Sundararajan, a professor and the Rosen Faculty Fellow at New York University, here to answer any questions. Uh, in true um, issue briefing style, we'll start with uh, uh, some brief opening remarks by Arun and then please feel free to ask your questions. We do have translation devices to ask your question in any language you, you like. We're also taking questions on social media as we have been throughout the day. And welcome, by the way, to our audience watching live on weforum.org. Um, Aaron, I'm going to ask you to start with, where next for the sharing economy? Is it, a, is it a niche? Is it going to go away? Is it going to get bigger and transform or even spell the end of capitalism? Well, um, I don't think it's going to spell the end of capitalism. It's just going to transform it into a world where capitalism is more crowd-based rather than being industrial. Um, if you think about it, the sharing economy's um, primary impact like, has been um, most saliently on the transportation industry. Um, it's uh, certainly got the automotive sector worried. Um, Short-term accommodation, the hotel industry is definitely sort of being disrupted in part by Airbnb. Um, and so these are particular industries that seem to be um, like, you know, changing quite significantly now because of the creation of peer-to-peer -peer markets that threaten the traditional business model of industrially or institutionally provided accommodation or transportation. Um, the industries that I see sort of following um, are likely to be perhaps sort of alternative energy, um, certainly healthcare. Um, additive manufacturing will create a whole host of peer-to-peer -peer alternatives to traditional manufacturing. So those are the industries that might go. Um, you know, um, in, to, to, to address the issue of whether it's a flash in the pan or whether it's something that is here to stay, I definitely think it's here to stay. Um, there are, um, you know, a number of ways in which it's going to redefine what we think of as a job. Um, like, you know, in 10 or 20 years from now, a much larger fraction of the world's population is going to make a living um, doing multiple things through platforms, in some ways being micro-entrepreneurs of sorts, rather than holding one job in which they sort of work a fixed number of hours every week or every month and uh, get paid by one institution. And so it's here to stay. Um, it's hitting some industries now. It's going to sort of expand its scope of industrial disruption. Um, and it's going to redefine what it means to have a job. I suppose you, you couldn't uh, have any clearer indication that, that in, uh, an economic um, transitions time has come uh, than having the, the, the Premier of China mention it in his speech in the plenary session uh, at the, this meeting indeed here today, this morning. Yep. Um, give us an idea of what you think his transformational capability is for you know, countries like China, uh, other large markets, as, as well as the markets uh, the US, where it's possibly the most, uh, most advanced and most developed. Yes, I mean, I, I was happy to hear the Premier remark this morning that um, you know, the mass entrepreneurship and innovation that is facilitated by the sharing economy um, is likely to um, improve the state of wealth distribution in China. And I think what he's alluding to is the fact that if more and more people own tiny businesses rather than just being providers of labor, they start to be owners of not, not just providers of labor but owners of capital as well. And as a consequence, the fraction of the population that is able to innovate, that owns their own business, and that is you know, um, part of the segment of the population that sort of is that faster growing segment, the segment where like, people who own capital tend to sort of see higher income growth rates than people who provide labor. And so that will be equalizing in the long run. Um, I, you know, to me, um, China is the biggest potential market for the sharing economy in the world, um, bigger than the United States for sure. 
um, already, um, you know, and, and the reasons for that are simple. You know, the, currently the major enabling technology um, for the sharing economy has been the smartphone. Um, the fact that you've got a sort of internet-enabled, high-speed, platform-based computer that hundreds of millions of people carry around in their pockets. And so it allows you to sort of redefine how you consume. You don't have to own, maybe you can sort of get it when you need it. You can call a taxi on demand, for example. So if you start with that point and you realize that um, China has 600 million smartphone users at this point, um, um, more than any other country, like you know, there are two smartphone users in China for every smartphone user in the United States, more than two. Um, and so the um, and the set of like you know sort of the population like you know the middle class and the upper middle class, um, even though um, like you know their total spending power per person is lower, the sheer size of that segment in China over the coming decade is going to make um, like you know this the biggest market for the sharing economy. Um, at this point, Didi Kuadi, um, who you'll see on a panel tomorrow. Um, I believe has three times as many users as Uber, just in China compared to Uber around the world. Um, you know, the um, Airbnb just made a significant sort of advance into the United S in, in, into China. Um, the um, second largest um, Airbnb-like um, sort of uh, company is um, based in China, and so um, you know, I, I think that it's. Um, you know, these countries, India, China, Brazil, Russia, um, will have to sort of create a large fraction of the world's work sort of in the coming decades. And I think a key enabling factor is going to be the sharing economy, this sort of like, you know, mass empowerment, uh, mass entrepreneurship, mass innovation will have a much bigger impact on the countries which have a much greater need for job creation and job growth. Uh, it's interesting when you put it into the context of jobs, and of course we're, we do a lot of work here at the Forum on uh, the future of jobs and, and which industries will be most affected um, by, uh, by, by disruption and transition. I guess it's interesting. The future of jobs is, is changing, and, and of the 100 million plus jobs that need to be found in, in just in Africa alone every year, they're not going to be made, you know, created in factories or in shops and services. Yeah. They're going to be created by people owning, owning uh, you know, access, having access to finance, becoming investors in their own right. Yeah. And in some sense, this is very empowering, right? Because um, you don't have to actually depend on a industrial provider, a factory, like, you know, sort of like, you know, a garment manufacturer, um, a call center operator to be able to sort of, you know, create employment for hundreds of thousands or millions of people. Um, instead, individuals can sort of sense what the market need is in their country and they are given access potentially to the capital and to the tools necessary to be able to sort of transform that understanding of a local market into a small business. And so to me, the, um, you know, there are often two um, scenarios that are painted about the on-demand or gig economy that is sort of like, you know, associated with the sharing economy. Um, one is, and you know, if, uh, if you're interested, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the forum um, published a blog post that sort of like, you know, described some of these issues um, this morning. Um, but like, you know, one of the scenarios is always the empowered entrepreneur. And this is the scenario that many of us believe in, that like, you know, you will sort of scale um, the set of people who are able to actually sort of realize their dreams, like, you know, sort of these platforms become gateways to innovation, finishing school for entrepreneurs. And then there's the other scenario, the more dystopian scenario, where you have like, you know, sort of lots of people plugged into these platforms providing labor, and the platform captures sort of like, you know, most of the economic rent. And so it's going to be interesting to see which of these two plays out more saliently. But early indicators um, from my research and the research of others are that it will be the first scenario. Lots of points here I'd like to develop. Yeah. But let's, let's focus on China, because this week uh, Uber announced a, a large, um, uh, raising of capital to fund expansion, a billion dollars, I believe, yeah. Yeah. Um, leads to the question, is, is that going to lead to a saturation of the market? Can the market just expand to, you know, exponentially to, to suit the amount of capital there? Well, um, that particular sector, sort of point-to-point -point urban transportation, um, is in a sort of dramatic growth phase. 
Um, and I think that there are two things to take into consideration when thinking about like, you know, sort of the massive amounts of venture capital that are going into the sector. Uber has six billion dollars, they've got a billion dollars for China. Didi Kwadi, which is sort of the market leader in China, has close to four billion dollars in venture capital. Um, but, you know, uh, first of all, um, like, you know, this is a point in the evolution of this industry where, um, like, you know, the platforms are trying to sort of capture supply. They're trying to get as many people driving cars as possible to plug into their platforms. And, you know, a driver in Shanghai does nothing for the demand in Beijing. A driver in Dalian does nothing for, like, you know, the demand in Shanghai. And so this is sort of a supply build out city by city. It's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, very capital intensive. Um, and so, um, like, you know, I fully expect that more and more capital will be sort of expended in this growth phase. But these are small numbers if you put them into context, right? Because if you think about it, um, what eventually this industry will threaten is the automobile industry. Um, the notion of owning your own car. Um, the alternative being you sort of call one on demand whenever you need it as an alternative to car ownership. And if you think about that, um, like, you know, the average car in the United States is used like five or six percent of the time. Um, so it's got very low efficiency of use. When it's being used, it's sort of being used at 20 or 30 percent capacity. So you've got one to two percent. And the things aren't very different in China or in Europe. And so you've got one to two percent capacity utilization for an industry that is often like, you know, a low double digit percentage of GDP. It's like, you know, a trillion dollar industry in the United States or close to a trillion dollar industry here. So when you put it into context, like a few billion dollars into venture capital that like, you know, is shaping what might be the biggest disruptive threat to the automobile industry before autonomous vehicles become a reality, then it's not such a large amount of money and I don't see any danger in market saturation in the near term. Yeah. Okay, it's at this point where I normally open the floor to questions. Do we have any questions? Lady there, so two ladies. Uh, lady there first, please, and then we'll go to this lady in the second row. Could you remind us where you're from and your name, please? It's working. Sorry, can you, start, can you start my question again, please? It's working now. Uh, it's, uh, it's working now. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you mentioned, Professor, you mentioned two points about, one about the mobile user base and the, the consumer base in China. Uh, I just want to know besides these two, and how do you, how would you evaluate the, um, the, the eco landscape of the shared economy in China? And my second question is there, um, there's enhanced competitions here in China. Uh, for for the shared economies, no matter it's transportation or housing, but um, on the same hand, you mentioned that the pre premier appealed to uh, more opening up to the new economies, to the shared economies and the entrepreneur and, and the collaborative needs between Chinese companies and the international peers. How would you think this factor will shape the industry in the next five years? Thank you. Okay, I'll try and address your first question briefly and then maybe touch on your second. Um, yes, um, like, you know, sort of a, technolo a technologically enabled population is an important part of, um, like, you know, sort of a, a vibrant sharing economy. These technologies are fundamental enablers. A digital trust infrastructure that is also emerging is a, another key enabler. Um, I also think that an advantage that China has um, in sort of like, you know, being a promising sharing economy marketplace is that, say, take the United States, um, a lot of consumption behaviors are already entrenched. People are used to owning their cars. A vast majority of the population that is a potential car owner already owns a car. Like, you know, a large fraction of the population got used to staying in hotels. And so there was sort of a big behavior shift that was needed before Airbnb got popular. And there is a huge behavioral shift that is necessary in the consumption patterns of US customers before Uber becomes a viable alternative to owning a car. In China, on the other hand, people are much sort of not as far advanced along in that sort of consumption cycle 
um, a significant fraction of the population is just learning sort of consumption behaviors, right, and just scaling it. And so there's a very good chance that they will come of age as consumers in a world where the sharing economy alternatives are available. So we won't have to, have to switch them from owning two cars to taking DD. Um, they will just sort of start doing that as consumers, and so the transition will be a lot easier. Um, to touch on your second question, um, you know, I, I think the most, you know, I, I think whether it's um, a multinational platform or a China-based platform, um, that's less important actually. What's more important is that these platforms facilitate this kind of large-scale entrepreneurship. You know, um, people who are Uber drivers are sort of taking small loans and setting up their own small business, right? And this is happening, millions of drivers now are providers of like you know transportation but they're doing it as a tiny business owner so i think this is the kind of sort of mass entrepreneurship that is being enabled um when marketplaces like alibaba and etsy sort of take off um you're empowering millions of people to become manufacturers and retailers not large-scale massive manufacturers and retailers like walmart but manufacturers of one sort of like you know the makers that the premier mentioned that he had visited, and sort of small-scale retailers. And so whether it's through a multinational platform or whether it's through a domestic platform, I think the critical element here is to make sure that the platform itself is facilitating enough entrepreneurship and innovation and not converting these providers into simply provi providers of labor, that they should sort of retain some capital ownership as well. Okay. Um, the lady in the front row, second. Do we need translation? Sure. Uh, I'm from Bloomberg Business Week, and but I still want to ask a Chinese question. I want to ask a question. Chinese. You want. So my question is that you have mentioned that in the shared economy, there are some industries that might be changed, including the alternative energies and the manufacturing industry. So my question is, uh, how, in what way will the shared economy impact and change those industries? And the second question is, uh, in the development of uh, the shared economy, what might be the obstacles, like uh, the regulatory obstacles, that may have the industry on the shared economy? So the question um, is about um, like, you know, how exactly is the sharing economy going to change industries that I mentioned are on the horizon, like um, manufacturing, um, energy, healthcare. Um, <clears throat> and so if you think about it, right now the provision of energy is largely centralized. Um, there is um, sort of institutional, industrial sort of scale production of power um, that is then distributed. And so it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's an industry in which you have a few large providers. Um, like, you know, there are solutions emerging where someone can finance, you know, I can finance someone's solar panels. Um, they can set up solar panels. They can become a provider of solar energy, not just for themselves, but for a couple of people who are close to them. And so at this point in time, um, like, you know, individuals can start to sort of become producers of energy, not just for themselves, but through a peer-to-peer -peer market for people in their local community. And so there is a lot of efficiency that is gained by this because you don't have to sort of transmit the power from sort of a distant source. So I think as these sort of localized alternative energy options start to take off, um, through peer-to-peer -peer markets, we may see a decentralization of the supply of energy. Um, similarly, in manufacturing, um, we're seeing a transition away from reductive manufacturing, like you know, which is today's manufacturing model, where um, you sort of take a sort of like you know, you you take sort of like raw material and then you reduce it to what it's supposed to be. And now we're seeing the emergence of increasingly sophisticated 3D printers, which are additive manufacturing, where you sort of create it from scratch. You create it from the material rather than taking the material and reducing it. Um, as these 3D printers get more and more sophisticated, again, it decentralizes um, the manufacturing process. 
you know, you don't need a large scale provider of smartphone covers, for example. Any individual can design a smartphone cover today and can sell the design and someone prints it on the local 3D printer. And so this completely sort of is a rethinking of the model of mass manufacturing in which the manufacturing is decentralized and sort of put in the local community. Um, similarly, I think in the provision of low-end healthcare, for example, you cut your finger while cooking and um, like, you know, you need to get it stitched up. Um, you know, I think that there's a big market opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer provision, like, you know, a qualified healthcare provider gets connected to you through a sharing economy marketplace and fulfills that, bypassing the need, for example, to go to an emergency room. And so in certain sectors, I, I see that there is inefficiency in provision of certain things in the traditional industrial model um, that as these technologies sort of progress, alternative energy additive manufacturing, we will see sort of a shift towards like, you know, sharing economy or peer-to-peer -peer models. Any other questions? Lady in the third row. Uh, I'm from Tencent. And uh, from your presentation, I heard that uh, the shared economy impacted housing and the transportation, including the Airbnb, the emerging Airbnb. And you also mentioned uh, the potential in China of uh, shared economy is higher than in U.S. But uh, I have a question that uh, China has a a, a short house uh, leasing uh, company that just, just copy Airbnb. And uh, actually, there are less houses that are shared by the individuals uh, than the uh, houses shared by the intermediaries. So the intermediaries actually take over uh, providing more housing resources. So in this situation, when the shared economy really take off here in China, um, there might be some people that might be impacted. So for this kind of issue, how to deal with that? That, um, you know, um, there's certainly a question of is the supply going to come from individuals or is it going to come from new intermediaries that sort of like say aggregate like, you know, hundreds of apartments and then start to provide them through um, like, you know, uh, an Airbnb-like platform. Um, that's certainly a possibility. Um, I think that what will determine the answer to that question will be two factors. One will be the regulatory issues that actually came up in a previous question. Um, right now, there are regulatory barriers, for example, in the United States to being a large-scale sort of, um, like, you know, um, intermediary that is providing sort of apartments as hotels. And so that has been a barrier to the emergence of these intermediaries in the U.S. Um, I'm not sure if similar regulatory barriers exist in China, but um, you know um, that will be one determining factor. Um, a second determining factor will be the amount of supply, like you know the amount of excess capacity. Um, if there is a lot of spare real estate, um, then these intermediary model is more likely because they can just take over a bunch of apartments and repurpose them as short-term accommodation. If, on the other hand, the real estate is being used efficiently and so you are tapping into small slices of availability of space someone's spare bedroom someone's apartment when they travel um, that kind of situation is much more likely to lead to individuals being the suppliers rather than intermediaries Aaron, we're running out of time but i want to just uh, pick up on a, one of the points you made which is actually okay. the, going back to jobs and you paint two scenarios. One is a you know, virtuous scenario, practically, where you know, people are empowered by the sharing economy. And another one is where the, the, the platform comes off best. And there's going to be winners and losers, for sure. And I think, believe you've done some research into, in, into which various industries. Either way, there's going to be a lot of work in terms of, of gearing people up for this, this new structure of work, getting them to think like entrepreneurs, um, getting governments to provide safety nets to, to, you know, to, to to give a bit of security and, yep. and, 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 and to cover the, you know, the move towards a more flexible style of working. Um, you know, that's going to cause a bit of pain in the short term. What's your, what's your view on how to manage that process 
as, as sustainably and, and as stably as possible? Well, um, you know, on, on the provision of the safety net, I think that's going to be one of the big challenges of the next couple of decades. Um, we have evolved into sort of economies where in a number of countries, um, you know, the provision of the things that we're proud of, the things that we associate with progress, like, you know, sort of income stability, um, paid vacations, um, like, you know, health benefits, um, insurance, worker protections, all of those things are tied very closely to having a full-time job, right? And we're going to have to start decoupling that and we have to come up with a new funding model for these benefits because they don't come free, right? And at this point, in a number of economies, they are funded largely by the company that you work for. And so we have to invent new ways of funding these capital contributions to society. And um, I think that for some countries, um, like, you know, there will be a greater role that government will play. Um, I think in other countries, in particular in the United States and the UK, um, I think that there are going to be new government individual market partnerships where um, the individual somehow contributes to the provision of this safety net. The, like, you know, the government provides a tax break, like, you know, the platform or some other sort of corporate entity that you might be connected with also might play a role. Um, but it's not going to be an easy transition um, because, um, and you know, it's a time when we need to be vigilant because um, it's very easy to imagine a situation in which these hard-won protections sort of slip away gradually over time. And then we look back in a decade and we say, hey, I mean, like, you know, this has led to a lot of economic efficiency, but are we really better off? Uh, and at a time, of course, also when um, business leaders are under pressure to actually raise wages for the, for the benefit of wider economic growth. So yeah. again, you're having pre downward pressure on wages through, through the growth of the sharing economy sometimes. Yeah, and I think that in, in that sense, I mean, like, you know, what the eventual ownership structure of the platforms is, is going to play a critical role in determining, like, you know, how, how, how the spoils are divided. Um, like, you know, there are a number of um, proponents of um, the idea that much like a worker cooperative, a platform might be owned by its providers. Um, that's an extreme scenario. I think that there may be sort of a middle ground where key providers take sort of stock ownership stakes in a platform in the same way that employees have in certain companies, but, you know, sort of in a, it, this has to be structured in a slightly different way. But I think as we sort of spread ownership among the base of people who are the suppliers, um, we will naturally probably end up with sort of a more robust funding model for these capital contributions. Um, I think what government should be doing is realizing that, um, you know, the idea that your workforce is a set of people who work for one company and receive a salary is a 20th century notion. And the 21st century workforce is going to be a much, in a, in a much larger way, um, a group of entrepreneurs rather than a group of salaried workers. And finally, would you agree then that the, the most critical factor that will underpin the, the success of the sharing economy is getting that platform right and getting the, the safeguards in place and the regulation in place to make sure that it's geared towards providing that kind of, the, you know, the kind of framework that protects workers and, and wages? Um, absolutely. I think in the um, early days of the sharing economy, which is over the last five years, um, the key regulatory battles that have been fought have been on consumer protection, you know, on like, you know, our taxis, you know, we've got all this safety laws for taxis and hotels, like, you know, they translate to Airbnb and Uber and Didi. And, um, but I think over the next five years, the key regulatory battles are on the provider protection or the worker protection. And so certainly sort of those are the critical policy choices for the next few years. Aaron Sindararajan. It's been a pleasure having you down here in the issue briefing room today. Okay. Thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us here today and thank you for watching online. This issue briefing is now closed.